You did use that. You did use that. Did I put it up a little higher? You work on that. I have this mic on because I have a couple of videos. I want to show them. Oh, yeah. Start check, check, check. Sounds like the highs are a little high. Low, maybe a little low. Check, 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 check. I'm glad we got a sound guy today, and it is 6:40. If Michael would ever get me fixed, and sound good. Just go. All right. It is. It is hot. Hot mic. Hot mic. Um, what's what now? Do have our class outside. You and Delina would love that, wouldn't you? I tell you what, you all go out there and wait, and we'll be out there in a little bit. All right? Uh, anybody with questions can go outside. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, so glad that you're here. So glad that we can laugh and have fun. Let's pray, and we'll get started. Father, I thank you for tonight. Lord, I pray that you'll guide our discussion, guide our uh, lessons tonight, that uh, you will be glorified in all things. Um, Lord, we just praise you and honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, uh, Scott uh, talked in this class in Discipleship Central about creation. Um, and that night, Scott focused on the physical realm of creation. Tonight, we're going to look at God's creation in the spiritual realm. We're looking at the fun topic of angels, demons, and Satan. So, Satan. Um, so I know that's going to bring up questions. Unfortunately, I don't know how I got this night, but uh, but here's the deal. I'm going to make you a deal because I don't like. I, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like questions. <laughs> I, I, I just don't. And so uh, I'll make you a deal. Uh, we'll go through this, and whatever questions you have at the end, we'll try to answer. Sound good? All right. I'll try to leave some time and answer some questions. But hopefully we'll address them as we go. That's my goal. Um, so as we look at that, what do we think about when we think about angels? Well, that's where we're going to start first. A lot of times it's this, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, halos and wings. Um, what about this? For some of you, it may be this. <laughs> angels in the outfield, right? Helping the angels play baseball. Some of you even go back to this. <laughs> right? I remember watching that show. Um, what about this one? Uh, some people were touched by angels. Um, or even this one. Every time a bell rings, an angel gets its swing. I've never seen that movie. We'll never see that movie. So, um, I know, see, I can say anything about angels now, and I will not look like a heretic as much as that comment right there. <laughs> Ooh, I have thought about Charlie's angels. Uh, Man, if you have been in the office today, that would have been brought up. You should have said something. Anyway, that's kind of what we think about a lot of times is because that's what's in culture. Culture tells us this is what we should think about angels. They're, they're helping us out. They're uh, doing good, and, and uh, uh, they're spirit beings that take on human form. And so tonight we're going to look at angels. Uh, and we can define angels this way. This is how Brutum defines them, and this is how we can. Angels are created spiritual beings with moral judgments and high intelligence, but without physical bodies. Um, so we're going to go through a bunch of different things that talk about 
angels and it will hit demons and Satan later. Uh, literally hit him, you know. But uh, anyway, I digress. Created spiritual beings. What does that mean? It means that angels haven't always existed. They didn't exist until they were created. Uh, they are part of the universe that God created. Paul tells us that God created all things visible and invisible through Christ and for him. Then specifically includes the angelic words, uh, world with this phrase, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities. All those words describe the angelic world in Colossians 1. Um, they exercise moral judgment. You think, what? Angels have moral judgment? What, what in the world? In the fact that some of them sin and fell from their positions, right? And we're going to talk about that here in a minute. But 2 Peter 2 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment. So we see, uh, and, and so we see that they have moral judgment because they can choose right or wrong. We also see they have high intelligence because they can speak to us uh, and they sing praises to God. It's the only other creation besides humans that can do those things. Um, if you have a dog that is talking to you, you need to go see someone because <laughs> it's not an angel. Well, I mean, you don't have okay. an angelic dog? <laughs> Probably not. Maybe a dog, but definitely not a cat. Uh, so, uh, but uh, but since they're spirits, they do not have physical bodies. Uh, typically unseen to us, they are around at all times, God, unless God gives us special ability to see them. I say that about a dog that could talk, but we know in Scripture there was a donkey who could talk, and that's Balaam, right? Remember, Balaam kept stopping; his donkey kept stopping in the road. And he was beating the tar out of that donkey. Yeah. And finally, God opened his eyes and he saw the angel with the sword in front of him. And so that's for us. There's angels all around. We may not see them, but the spirit world is all around. Until God opens our eyes to see them, uh, we're not. And so, and then from time to time, they did take on a physical form. To appear to various people in scripture. Um, the second thing I want you, us to see is there's other kind of spiritual beings, right? These there, there are three other specific types of heavenly beings named in scripture. They not sure whether these are special kind of angels or distinct beings created by God to serve God and to worship God, but the first is cherubim. That's where we kind of go back to that first little uh, baby with the Angels that look like babies, you know, with the wings, and that's kind of what we think of when we think of cherubim. Uh, they're given the task of guarding the entrance of the Garden of Eden. When the when Adam and Eve, our first parents, were cast out, they were in charge of guarding guarding that entrance. Psalm 18 and Ezekiel 10 speak of God being enthroned on cherubim, or to travel with them as his chariot. Not sure how that works, but that's what it talks about in Scripture. We also, if you ever watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, on the ark there's cherubim, right? On it to guard, kind of uh, the picture of seating of the presence of God. Then we have seraphim, mentioned in Isaiah 6-2. This is probably the most famous passage about them, right? Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole world, earth is filled with his glory. So seraphim are, are there in the throne room of God. They are, they are worshiping him at all times. Kind of interesting. They have six wings. That's crazy. I mean... Uh, and I say that because can you imagine it? It's hard to fathom. I mean, these are these are beings that we really have no idea, except through Scripture, what they look like. Then the third 
um, heavenly beings is living creatures. We see this in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. They have appearances like a lion, an ox, a man, an eagle, um, and they worship God continually as well. Also with angels, we see they have rank and order. They have rank and order. Scripture indicates that there is rank among them, there is order among them, and we see that Michael is the archangel, right, in Jude 9, indicating he has rule or authority over the other angels. He also appears to be the leader of the army of angels. Uh, scripture doesn't tell us if Michael is the only archangel or if there's more of him or more of archangels. But we are led to believe, or at least we can believe, that he is an archangel. Um, and then the other one that is mentioned by name is Gabriel. Gabriel is mentioned as a messenger. Someone who brings messages from God, but never as an archangel. So if you hear somebody, well, there's two archangels, Michael and Gabriel. Well, that's it's not really how it's listed in Scripture. We see one as an archangel and one as a messenger. Other than that, we have no names of the angels. Um, um, only one place at one time. They're not like God. They can't be omnipresent. They can't be everywhere at once. They're at one place at one time. Uh, it takes me back to Daniel 10. And I love this passage. Um, and he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard. And I've come because of your words. First of all, I love that. From the first time you uttered the words to God, he heard them. Goes back to last week with Michael, uh, talking about prayer. The first time, in verse 13, the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the king, kings of Persia, and came to make you understand what has happened to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. He's saying, I was held up by dark forces, the the prince of Persia, or princes of Persia, this is indicating that, that evil spirits were there holding him up, doing battle with one another. He said, I was on my way, and for 21 days he held me up. But Michael came to my rescue and has held them off so I could come and bring this message to you. There's travel involved, right? They're not at one place, at, at places all at the same time. It's one place, one time, right? How many angels? How many angels do you think there are? Whole bunch, right? Legions of angels. A whole, whole, whole bunch. That's right. We don't know. If somebody asked me tonight, well, how many angels? I don't know. Right? Just lots. Great number. Scripture doesn't give us a figure. Deuteronomy 33, 2 says, ten thousands of holy ones. Psalm 68 says the chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. Hebrew 12 says innumerable angels. Revelation 5:11 says, then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders uh, and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. We have no idea, but there is a vast number of angels. Here's, here's one topic that, and I know we're going through these fast, because I'm trying to get to your questions. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I'm trying to do. No, it, it's such a vast topic, and we have a lot to cover. But guardian angels, some people say, well, I believe in guardian angels. I don't believe in guardian angels. Scripture clearly tells us that God sends angels for our protection. Psalm 91 says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hand will be, uh, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So this, this will lead some people to believe that each one of us have a guardian angel, especially detailed to be an angel for Michael, for Warren. <laughs> For Pat, right? I'm not so sure. Not that he couldn't. 
right? There's a vast number of angels and people die. So then they don't, they lost their job. So you got to find a new one, right? So it could happen, but that's not really what scripture's teaching here, I don't believe. I believe it's more as Grudem says, and we're a basketball state. We know basketball. They're more playing zone defense than man-to-man, right? That's more like it. They're, they're, it's not that we have a personal one. Hey, Mike, how are you, buddy? No, it's more of there's angels watching over us. They're protecting us all um, to make sure that uh, we are doing as God has intended. And, and uh, so it's more of a zone than a man-to-man. Um, so what are what is the place of angels in God's purpose? Why did he create them? Angels, I think, one, is they show the greatness of God's love and plan for us. Humans and angels are the only moral, the only highly intelligent creatures that God made. We talked about that just a little bit ago. And we can see and understand more about God's plan and his love for us when we compare ourselves to the angels. Man is created in the image of God, right? Angels are not. One, it sets us apart. We are created in the image of God. Angels are not. Angels, uh, and it seems to, to conclude, be fair to conclude that, that um, we are more like God than angels are. And I'm just going to bust your bubble right now. When you die, you don't become an angel. If that's what you come in here thinking when you walk in, I'm sorry. Um, I had a teenager when I went to Arizona. I was telling a few this afternoon. Uh, I had a teenager when I went to Arizona, and when I met her, she was a sweet girl. She was, I think she was seventh, eighth grader. She loved angels. She could not wait to become an angel. And it didn't take long for me to crush her hopes and dreams <laughs> and be like, sorry, you don't get wings. You don't get to be an angel. Uh, you are created in the image of God. You are a special being. You are a special um, uh, uh, being created by God for God. And God will one day give us authority over the angels. 1 Corinthians 6 says, do you not know that we are, we are to judge angels? At some point, we will judge the angels. Don't know how that works. Don't know how that's going to look. But that's what scripture tells us. For now, we may be a little lower than the angels, as Hebrews 2 says. But when our salvation is complete, when we are brought into heaven, when our race is run, we will be exalted above the angels to rule over them. Get off my screen. Uh, I've got a joke about this, but no. I was going to say the demon's in my screen. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Man, it's been good if that was in the section. But, um, but we are going to be above them. So to say, oh, I want to be an angel when I die is to say, I want to be less than what God intended, right? I don't want to reach my goal of what God had for me. In fact, angels serve us now. In a way, Hebrews 1.14 says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? So angels are already <coughs> serving us. Maybe not at our beck and call, but they are serving us in the way that God has intended at this time. Uh, the greatest way I think that they show the greatness in, of God's love and plan is while many angels sinned, none were saved. While many angels sinned and, and fell, none were saved. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 2, for if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until 
final until the final judgment. When the angels sinned, sinned, God redeemed none of them. When man sinned, he said, Jesus. He came to redeem us. The angels show us that God would have been right to not come. To let us inherit hell. God would have been just to leave us as we were. God would have been just to come and save five. Josh would have, uh, God would have been just to come and save 75. But God sent Jesus to die on the cross for us, to save us from our sins. The angels also remind us that the unseen world is real. 2 Kings 6, he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Remember that story? Boy was scared to death. We, we don't have enough people. He says, oh, Lord, open his eyes. He looked out, and there was the army of heaven ready to do the business of God. An unbelieving world would dismiss the talk of angels as superstition, but Scripture offers it as insight into the state of affairs as they really are. We can trust it. So angels also carry out some of God's plans. Um, one is their messengers. They bring messages. As we talked about earlier, Gabriel was a messenger. He brought messages to people. We see that uh, in Matthew and in, in the Gospels where the angels came and delivered messages to the shepherds and to Mary and Joseph, right? And, and so we see them as messengers. They also carry out judgments. We see them going and, and pronouncing judgments and giving out judgments to Israel and to all other these other places throughout um, the Old Testament. We see them also as those who patrol the earth as, as God's representatives. The archangel will ultimately proclaim the coming of Jesus, the second coming. It will be him that announces that. Angels also directly glorify God. Um, and this is probably what we think of first, and we're coming to it at towards the end, but they minister directly to God by glorifying God. Um, so what is our relationship with angels? How does it work? What does our relationship look like? Um, I think there's a couple of things. One, we should be aware of angels in our daily lives. When we worship, um, we are not worshiping alone. We are joining a host of those saints who have gone before us and the host of angels who are glorifying God and worshiping God at one time. They are a witness to our obedience and disobedience. Now, this can be good and bad, right? They, they see what we do. They see what we don't do. They know God's plan for us in that moment. And so it's sobering to think that when we sin, but it's encouraging to think that when nobody sees you being obedient, when you're discouraged, oh man, I wish somebody would know what I just did for, for that person or for the church. Or, uh, nobody said thank you. The angels saw. More importantly, Jesus saw. There's an old uh, Southern Gospel song, and Michael does not know it. Um, but uh, there's an old Southern Gospel song called The Clapping of the Nail-Scarred Hands. It talks about the old janitor who cleans the church. and He's singing praise and worship to Jesus. and uh, Nobody hears him, but he hears the clapping of the nail-scarred hands. You know, the thought there that God sees, the angels see, and it glorifies God. They also protect us as directed from God. Uh, think of... Daniel in the lion's den. Who shut the lion's mouth? Angels. Angels, right? Uh, Peter from prison. Who, who rescued him from prison? Who let him out? An angel. So they, are, they protect us as God directs them to protect us. The second thing is uh, we're to beware of false doctrine from angels, which would actually be demons. If they're giving us false doctrine, they're not angels, right? But Galatians 1.8 says, But even if 
we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And we've seen this in scripture play out. First Kings 13. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into the house that he, he may eat bread and drink water. Now, the prophet had been told, don't bring this person back. Don't feed them. Don't give them nothing to drink. And this guy says, no, no, no. I was given a word from the Lord by an angel to bring them in, give them food, give them water, give them drink. The very next line in verse 18 of 1 Kings 13 says, but he lied to him. But he lied to him. So whatever angel would have told him that was a liar. Satan and demons can mask themselves and speak contrary to the word of the Lord. But God will never contradict himself. He will never contradict himself. Mormons are the example here. Uh, an angel, Moroni, which is suspicious anyway, guys. Uh, and I'm not making fun, but angel Moroni spoke to Joseph Smith and gave him the basis of Mormonism, which is contrary to the teaching of Scripture at many different points. And this should be re rejected as demonic and false. It's not real. It's not true. It was not of God. Third thing here is don't worship angels. Don't pray to them. Don't seek them. Um, worship of angels was one of the false doctrines being taught at Colossae. The angel in Revelation warns John not to worship him. Um, we're also not to pray to him. We pray to who? We pray to God alone through Jesus Christ. You did say that last week. I keep going back because Michael did a wonderful job. Oh, uh, And in no point in scripture does it indicate that we should seek out angels. We're going to go to the Lord, right? So, I'm just going to confess to you. Many years ago, I was, and Amy knows this story, so it's not a shock to her. So don't be like, oh, I'm going to tell Amy. Uh, she'll probably go, yeah, I've heard that story a million times. Stupid. Um, before I met Amy, I was in a relationship with this girl. And I knew I shouldn't have been in a relationship with this girl. Shouldn't have been doing it, Right? And every time I'd leave her, I'd be like, Lord, I just don't know. If you don't want me with her, you know, I don't want you to scare me because I was driving, right? <laughs> I don't want you to scare me, but, you know, you would send an angel to tell people. And, and that's just what I need. I need an angel to be in the seat beside me to let me know, right? Don't run me off the road. I don't want to die. I don't want to meet you today. But I would like to know. And God is sitting there going, you big dummy. You already know. I don't have to send this. I've already told you. Right? But I was seeking the counsel of angels as proof of what God had already told me. Don't even do that. When God's already said it, you follow what God has said. That's it. Done. No more. So, anyway, that's a bad story on me. Hope you. Huh? I did for several months, and then finally I broke it off and never saw her again. And a month later, I met Amy and uh, was married a year later. So, see, I just had to be obedient to God. Um, now we will switch gears a little bit. Uh, what time is it? You're doing great. Oh, no, I've probably got plenty of time. Don't You're doing great. Oh, great. Plenty of time for questions. Oh, man. All right. So, we've all talked about uh, angels and what culture tells us about them. What do you think about when you think of demons or Satan? Evil. Evil, okay. Red horns and a pitchfork. Red horns and a pitchfork. <laughs> right? <laughs> I don't know why he had to try to, like, is he the... I don't know. It's like he's mixed with Poseidon. Poseidon, yes. I couldn't think of what it was. Um, what else do you think about? Fire. 
Fire, okay. Deceiver. Deceiver. Yeah. yeah. Sin. Sin. Okay. I got temptation. Temptation. Okay. Great. Yes. All those. I've got a couple of quick little, like, very short videos. Because I love videos. You love videos. And, and Trask had, like, this up here the other night. Oh. So I had to outdo him somehow. So I have videos. <laughs> No. <laughs> Hopefully you can hear it. <laughs> Even in culture, they go, I don't know what to associate with this guy. This is one Michael and I have been talking about for at least two weeks about making sure that I had. <laughs> All right, so I'll leave the church lady up there. Uh, oh, I turned to Mike. Um, anyway. So, as we had the definition of, of, of angels, demons are evil angels who sinned against God and who now continually work evil in the world. Uh, so, what is the origin of demons? Well, when creation was completed, everything was good, right? Everything was good. But somewhere between Genesis 1 and Genesis 3, there was a rebellion in the angelic world with many angels turning against God and becoming evil. Second Peter and Jude tell us a lot that, that we get from this about uh, angels that rebelled against God and became hostile opponents to his word. Um, their sin seems to have been pride, a refusal to accept their assigned place. Jude 6 says it this way, And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. We see Isaiah 14, what could be a description of the fall of Satan. In verse 12, he says, How you have fallen from heaven, O day star, son of, da of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to the heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to Sheol, to the far reaches of the pit. Ezekiel 28 says it this way. You are the signet of perfection, full of wisdom. And perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Sardis, topaz, and diamond. Beryl, onyx, and jasper. Sapphire, emerald, and carbuncle. Sure. And crafted in gold were your settings and your engravings. On the day that you were created, they were, pre uh, they were prepared. You're an anointed guardian cherub. I placed you. You were on the holy mountain of God in the midst of the stones of fire you walked. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till unrighteousness was found in you. In the abundance of your trade, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. So I cast you as profane thing from the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O guardian cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was proud because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I exposed you before kings to feast their eyes on you. But the multitude of your, by the multitude of your iniquities, the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. So I uh, brought fire out from the mist. It consumed you, and I turned you to ashes on the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who know you among the peoples are appalled at you. 
You have come to the dreadful end and shall be no more forever. It's explaining how the pride is what was the fall of Satan and those that followed him. So Satan is the head of demons. He's the leader of the evil pact, right? I've got to give me a little L.A., sorry. Um, so what are the names we know of, of Satan? Give me some names that we know that... Beelzebub. Beelzebub. What else? Lucifer, the devil. Lucifer, the, devil. Serpent. the serpent. Adversary. Adversary. Satan means adversary. Um, I thought it was fascinating. I was, uh, in, in the, uh, Brudem says in the book, in his research, Lucifer is only mentioned in the King James Version of the Bible. It's not mentioned anywhere else. It's only mentioned once, and it's not mentioned in any modern great translations. Um, and you were saying that Lucifer is a? Match. Is a match. It's what they used to call matches before we decided to call them matches. Uh, because of the phosphorus and thinking of the fire and brimstone. And... Look how cool you are. Uh, see, I listen. Michael would not have listened, but I listened to you. Um, there you go, Michael. See? Um, but, uh, but yes, uh, the devil, serpent, ruler of this world, prince of the power of the air, the evil one. Um, Satan and, and his demons, uh, there's activity all over the place, right? He was the originator of sin. He sinned before any human did. He tempted Eve, in turn tempting Adam. John tells us that he was a murderer from the beginning and is a liar and the father of lies. Doesn't mean that when he says he is a murderer from the beginning, that doesn't mean a beginning before God created the world. It means he was a, from the beginning of his existence. He was a, a murderer from the beginning. Um, they also oppose and try to destroy every work of God. He's been trying to destroy everything that God cares about since the very beginning. Going back to Adam and Eve, um, he is, he's tried to destroy Jesus and the work and the mission that Jesus was on by tempting him in the wilderness, right? Uh, Satan and his demons use every, each and every tactic that they can think of to blind people to the gospel. They use temptation. They use doubt, they use guilt, they use fear, they use confusion, sickness, envy, pride, slander, and all this to, to hinder or to, um, uh, to stop the witness and the usefulness of Christians. Demons are limited by God's control and have limited power. We said that God gave permission and limited it, uh, Satan's power when, um, that when he goes and asks for Job. Right? He says, you can do this, but you can't do this. Right? Grudem says it this way. After rebelling against God, they, demons, do not have the power they had when they were angels. For sin is weakening and a destructive influence. While they are mighty, they're not what they, what's that old song? I may not be what I once was, but I'm good once as I ever was or whatever. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, they're not as good as they once was, but they're still powerful. Um, but they're probably less powerful than angels. Um, there's no indication that they can know the future or read our minds or thoughts. I remember there was times where I would pray in my mind because I didn't want God, I didn't want Satan to hear me, right? Uh, because he can't read our thoughts. He can't read our minds. That is... God and God alone, Jesus and God can know our thoughts even before we think them. Angels, demons, Satan, they cannot. Now, they can observe. They can kind of hear conversations that you have on the telephone or with other people and kind of guess what you're going to do and, and, and predict what you're going to do because of that. And so when you go to some, uh, maybe you see a fortune teller or somebody go, well, you know what, uh, Barry, I know that you had eggs this morning for breakfast and, you know, blah, 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 this is what you did yesterday. And you go, wow, how did you know? Because the demon saw you do it, right? And then pass that information along. 
It's not the fact that they are all knowing and they can tell the future. Because they don't know when Jesus is coming back. Only Jesus does. Right? If they knew the future, only God knows. If they knew the future, Satan would have known he was defeated at the cross and the empty tomb before it happened. I don't think he did. I think when Jesus walked out of that tomb, he's like, oh no, what? Right? <laughs> like, well, that didn't work. I, I thought that was a surefire thing. So there are stages of, of how they have worked in the redemptive history. The Old Testament, we see the, the we don't see a lot about demons in the Old Testament, but we see the worship of false idols. We see the worship, um, which is which is really demonic worship. We see child sacrifice. That is demonic activity. Um, and there was a lot of, in the ministry of Jesus, Jesus cast out demons. Uh, never in the in the course of history had that really been done until Jesus did it. In the New Covenant age, um, Jesus gave the authority over demons to the twelve, and then he gave it over to the seventy disciples. And then the early church ministered uh, in Jesus' name, Acts eight, which I believe um, Tras is going to hit this Sunday. Acts eight seven for unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed who were paralyzed or lame were healed and then in the final judgment they're going to be done away with right final judgment satan will ultimately be defeated and thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur he'll be tormented day and night forever and ever revelation 20 says so what is our relationship with demons look like well are they active today yes Yes, they are. Some deny the existence as ancient myths. They'll say demons and angels were, were just ancient myths that were propagated by religious people, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But if scripture is to be trusted, and it is, then demons are active in the world today. Um, Brad Stein, a Christian comedian, uh, used to say that Catholics see the Virgin Mary everywhere. Right? They see her in toast. They see her on the sides of buildings. They see her in everything. But Protestants see the devil everywhere. Right? Uh, I lost my job today because of the devil. No, the devil just woke you up. Your incompetence lost your job. Right? We can't blame everything on Satan and the demons. We have a lot to be um, at fault for, too. Uh, but they are very active today. Um, this is one that I figure we're going to have questions about, but can a Christian be demon possessed? <laughs> well, it depends on your definition of possessed. Um, possessed as a person, person's will is completely dominated by a demon to where the person has no <laughs> power left um, to, to make a right uh, choose right or obey God, then no, a Christian cannot be possessed. Um, Romans 6, 14, for sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. But there are differing levels of demonic attack or influence in a believer's life. It can be strong at times. It can be weak at times. It can be non-existent at times. But Satan will attack you. Satan will try to influence you. He will do it in a myriad of ways. So, we should, uh, the good news is, we should expect the gospel to come in power to triumph over the works of the devil. We're almost done. We're almost to questions. I still have time. Oh, we're pretty close. <laughs> when Jesus preached in Galilee, demons came out of many, Luke tells us. Right? Acts 8, we just read that. Um, when Philip preached in Samaria, unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who had them. We should expect 
that when the gospel is faithfully preached, that there will be victory over evil and triumph over the works of the devil. Does it mean that demons are going to come out of people every Sunday? No. But guess what? Evil will be suppressed. And ultimately, God will win. Ultimately, evil will fail. Ultimately, in the end, Satan and his demons will end up in hell for all of eternity where God has built for them to go. All right? couple questions. What you got? Oh, David Redford, I thought you liked me. I ask your forgiveness for asking you a question. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> what is your answer to when young people, when you, when you get into Satan, they say, why did God create Satan? I would say God created angels and Satan chose to defile God. Um, God did not create Satan as he is now. He chose to defile God. Um, just like Adam and Eve chose to ultimately defile God and re, uh, rebel against him. I forgive you for that one. <laughs> or it says that Satan was a murderer from the beginning. That doesn't mean the beginning of his creation. That means, I guess, the beginning of his fall. Correct, yeah. correct. And I said the beginning of his creation. And, and what I, I meant there is uh, not what I said. <laughs> is that a good way out of it? Uh, you're right. It was from the beginning of his fall. But it definitely doesn't mean before God created because he is part of the creation. Because that would have meant that would mean in the God who created you know, Correct. People yeah, correct. Okay, we're talking about demon possession. You get three. No, I'm telling you, you get three. This is two. <laughs> I'm just giving you our time. One, two, three, four. Oh, no. Sure, no we're three. talking about demon possession, and we know that, that Jesus cast out demons. Mm -hmm. So, and we just commented about the Christian. I mean, my personal belief is that, that a Christian cannot be demon possessed. You can be, a, you can be attacked, right. of course. Yes. The scripture says, greater is he that is within you than he that's within the world. Yep. But if for the unsaved, do you think we have people who are demon-possessed today? Yes. And if so, yes. what do you think about exorcism? Um, I will say, yes, I believe that a lot of folks that are in treatment for mental illness could be demon possessed. I'm not saying all, but I'm saying some. Um, and I believe that there are non believers that are possessed, um, whether it's for a time or for, you know, for their, their life. Uh, um, never done an exorcism. Uh, I believe, you know, uh, Jesus gave the disciples power to cast out demons. He gave it to the early church. Um, I believe in the power of Jesus. Demons have to flee. Have you ever looked into the eyes of somebody and felt you saw Satan? I did one time that scared me to death. I have, a, I have not. Personally. I, mean, I don't know that small. Uh, small but... I, have a, I have a really good friend when he was 18 years old, he was on a mission trip, and one of the, the other students that were with him, uh, he believes that he was heavily influenced, if not possessed at that moment. Okay, uh, so, no proof there, I'm just telling you what. You know, if people can be demon, demon possessed, do those demons enter that individual voluntarily, or does the person have to invite them in? How is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 it's not a bad question. I don't know. Uh, I've got thoughts. Here, here's the thing. I've got thoughts, but and I've said this, and this is not a cop out. I've got my own thoughts about it, and one day I'm going to 
know as I am known, right? I believe that I'm going, when I get to heaven, like God's just going to give me knowledge and I'm going to go, oh, wow. That's why that happened. That's why, you know, I'm going to know as God knows, kind of. And in that moment, I'm going to go, wow, I was so wrong there. Or I was pretty close, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, it, it's one of those things where I think we will know some of these answers and we may not know them on this side of heaven. But when we get there, I believe we're going to know. James, you had one? Uh, it's not a question. Oh, then what are you doing? This statement. Oh, okay. I can't understand. Maybe when I get to heaven, I will. How will I? I can't understand how somebody that worships the devil, if he worships the devil, then he's got to know there's a God. Just got why, how can they choose evil over good? I, that's I believe I believe it is the fool the fooling of Satan and demons. It's the great deceiver. I have a buddy, one of my best friends, that is as hostile to the gospel as anyone that I've ever met. One of the best guys on the planet will give you the shirt off his back would do whatever you needed as a stranger would do whatever you needed. He is as hostile to the gospel and to God mm. going to hell, raising his fist, drinking a beer on the way. You know, that, that just kind of hell raiser type of guy. That's, that's who he is. And he would say, I believe there's a God and I believe there's a hell. I'm just going to hell. Uh, I don't know, uh, but I believe, I believe that Satan has him so blinded to the gospel, so blinded to the truth, that until God peels back that curtain for him, that is the path he's going down. Now, God can do it, and I pray God will, uh, because I believe that he could be one of the greatest witnesses on this planet for Jesus were God to choose to save him. Um, and so, I am two minutes yeah, over. <laughs> now, you had one question that had four in it. You cheated. If angels don't have bodies like us, what are they like? Just little things just flying around? They're spirits. Just flying around? Uh, so, uh, um, they're, they're, they're a vapor. Uh, you know, they're, they're a spirit. So it's, it's like a mist. I would assume you can't see it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. There's no physical form. Um, and how do you describe that? Spirit. I mean, sometimes the, the only... It's kind of like when John was given the revelation, he gave the best words he had to describe what he saw. I don't know that it's going to be, I think it's the best thing he had. So spirit, I think, is the best word I've got. Uh, and it's, it's not good enough, but it's what I got. Well, I'm like her. I wonder, you know, if they don't have human, well, normal human form, they should be aware of them around us. Well, how, how are we to be aware of it? It's just a feeling. I mean, there are times when I, I thought, yeah, my guardian angel was looking out for me. Thank you. And then there are other times I think, well, you're going to be stepping that hole. <laughs> 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 Break my ankle. Yep. So, so how, how are we aware of around us? I, I think is is just knowing that not everything is coincidence. Yes. Not everything is happenstance. That. You know, you're walking down the street and all of a sudden that car swerves and misses That's right. you. That's an angel. Mm -hmm. You know, it could have been could have been that an angel slapped them in the face and woke them up or just had their hand there to, to guide them away. Yes. So the demon part I feel like is a little contradictory because in the second Peter two four it was written in the book twice. 
Mm -hmm. When they sinned and cast them into hell and committed them to chains that went in darkness, so if they've been committed to hell and into chains, how are they over here using destructive tactics of temptation and doubt and lies and then able to observe our daily... I believe in that. Uh, his Peter's description is their chain. They're 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 not free to do as they please. There there there's limits. Kind of like we talked about with Job, where God said, "You can do this, but you can't do that." God has put limits on them, chained them, to where they're still free to move about. They're still free to to influence and do the things that they're doing, but they're they don't have free reign. Does that make sense? Huh? How long is I, I, I don't know. Uh, and, and two, you know, uh, it's kind of like. Oh, there's a. Well, I know scripture says, like, when Satan, he was cast down to the world. Right. And so. Yeah. That, I mean, I just, I've never read that about the demon being chained. Yeah. And in, in Jude, it says that as well, right? Um, let's see. And he is kept in eternal chains until gloomy darkness, uh, under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So it's listed there in Scripture twice. But we know that uh, demons and Satan are running rampant. We can see it. Or not visibly see it, but we can see the effects, kind of like wind. We can't see the wind, but we can see the effects of the wind. So however that rectifies, Scripture rectifies the chains around them. They are bound in some form, fashion, whether it's just their power is limited. Maybe this is why um, uh, through sin, through their sin of pride, they're limited and diminished in their strength to where they can't, um, you know, um, do whatever they want. A couple of observations to that. Just again, I don't know that I know, but two other ways to interpret that about the chains would be that they're chained to where they can't get back into heaven. They're cast down to this world. Two, the chains might mean their eternal future yeah. is bound for that. Yeah. Good points. Let's pray. And then if you got more questions, Michael will be right over here. <laughs> you can ask him all the questions you want. No, I love you all. I, I want to say, I had fun tonight, whether you all did or not, I did, um, and I, I'm open book, you can ask me, and I'm just going to tell you I don't know, uh, if I don't know, um, I'm not going to try to make something up, uh, so, uh, but thank you for being here, let's pray, uh, and then we'll, then we'll be dismissed. Father, I thank you for tonight, I thank you for those folks here, I thank you for the illumina illumination of scripture in our lives, may we... Uh, trust you in the areas of where we are unsure and to trust your word where it speaks and where it is silent uh, and that that will be enough for us at this time until we are given full illumination and glory. Uh, be with us this week as we go and continue to serve the community and worship you uh, in the community. May you give us opportunities to share the gospel and to love on our, our uh, fellow Clark Countyans. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mark, it's a